Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by and welcome to our webinar, Nutrition, Weight, and Pregnancy Research Updates, sponsored by ISIS Parenting and presented by Dr. Rini Sen and Dr. Lorian Urban. My name is Chris Just. I'm the Executive Director of Prenatal Education here at ISIS, a certified nurse midwife, and your moderator today, along with Nancy Holtzman, VP of Clinical Content, Pediatric Nurse, and IBCLC, who will be typing with you in the chat room. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions to the speakers at any time by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen, or direct them to us on Twitter using our handle at Isis underscore parenting. We'll also take questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded, and all of you will receive a link to the recording early next week. So if you miss something or need to step away for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to host today's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers and online at isisparenting.com. As I mentioned, I'm Chris Just, and I'll be your moderator today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Dr. Rini Sen is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Tufts University School of Medicine and is board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics in Neonatal and Perinatal Medicine. She completed her medical training at Jefferson Medical College in 2002, her internship and residency at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in 2002 to 2005, with a fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine in 2006 to 2008. She has received many honors and awards, including most recently a Tufts Collaborates Award for the Interinstitutional Project, an intervention to reduce excess weight gain in obese pregnant women in 2012, and the American Society of Nutrition Excellence in Nutrition Research and Practice Award in 2011. Her main area of research interest is in maternal obesity. Dr. Lorian Urban is a graduate of the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. She holds a PhD in Biochemical and Molecular Nutrition. Dr. Urban has 11 years of industry and academic experience designing and managing multi-site clinical tri trials and food analysis studies. Her two groundbreaking studies analyzing 300 restaurant foods were published in JAMA and Journal of American Diet Association with attention from the FDA and over 500 media organizations, including Time Magazine, The New York Times, Reuters, CNN, and ABC World News. Her research now focuses on behavioral intervention studies to prevent excess weight gain and overweight and obese pregnant women. Thank you, Dr. Sen and Dr. Urban. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for joining us today. Whether you are pregnant or planning pregnancy, this is a critical period in your life and in the life of your baby. Over the past few decades, we have learned quite a bit about the importance of nutrition before and during pregnancy on your and your baby's health. Most women are very aware that making changes such as quitting smoking or not drinking alcohol during pregnancy can improve a baby's health and a mom's health during pregnancy. But there has not been as much discussion about the effect of nutrition on a developing fetus. In fact, your health status, your weight before pregnancy, the amount of weight you gain during pregnancy and the specific foods that you eat can uh, affect your baby's development, your pregnancy, and your, your lifelong health. During this time, you have an opportunity to make meaningful and lifelong changes in your and your family's nutritional habits. Making changes in life and nutrition is difficult at any time, but even more difficult during pregnancy. After this webinar, we hope that you will understand why it is important to monitor your weight gain during pregnancy and will be able to determine your own weight gain goals for pregnancy and discuss these goals with your doctor. We also hope to provide you with some concrete tools and tips for making changes in your diet. And since this is a one-hour webinar, we know we can't cover everything, but we hope we will also leave you with um, contact information for, for further questions.
Many women want to know the risks of entering pregnancy overweight or of gaining too much weight during pregnancy, both of which can be harmful for mother and baby. During pregnancy, women who are overweight or who gain too much weight are more likely to develop pregnancy-induced high blood pressure or preeclampsia, which is a more severe form of pregnancy-induced high blood pressure. In addition, there are a higher rate of pregnancy-associated diabetes, which can affect metabolism of the baby and the mother in the long term. In our lab, we recently found that women who enter pregnancy with, ex with excess weight have differences in critical cell types that help fight infection, which predisposes mothers and babies to serious and harmful infections, both in the womb and um, after delivery. In addition, there are differences in clotting that have been shown to lead to uh, predisposition to blood clots throughout the body of a pregnant woman. Women are more likely to deliver by cesarean section, uh, and this is because of the development of the medical complications that we've just discussed. In addition, we have seen a rapid increase in the past decade of babies who are born large for gestational age, which for a full-term infant, a baby born at term, is defined as a birth weight greater than 4 kilograms. Although this might not seem to be a problem, these babies are more likely to have difficulty maintaining their blood sugar after birth. They're more likely to have jaundice that requires treatment. They're more likely to incur birth injuries. And all of these factors um, might require a baby to have a stay in the neonatal intensive care unit after delivery. For mothers, weight gain during pregnancy is difficult to lose, and we will discuss this in a bit. Uh, we'll discuss in a bit how gaining too much weight during pregnancy can be the, be the beginning of a lifelong struggle with weight. Babies who are born to mothers who are overweight or obese or who gain too much weight during pregnancy are more likely to be delivered prematurely, mainly because of the medical complications that mothers uh, can develop during pregnancy. In addition, very early in pregnancy, before many women even know that they're pregnant, fetuses of overweight and obese women have an increased chance for, uh, of developing particular breast defects specifically breast defects of the heart, of the abdominal wall, and of the spinal cord. Our lab is currently researching how differences in nutrition and micronutrients might play a role in this. As infants leave the NICU or leave the hospital, unfortunately, more of these infants are likely to succumb to sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. And even further down the line, um, as these infants grow into children and adults, they have a lifetime increased risk for asthma and allergic diseases, and perhaps most importantly, are more likely to develop obesity or become overweight adults themselves. And although all of this might seem daunting, our goal with this webinar is to provide you with some tools and tips to help you navigate healthy nutrition and eating during pregnancy. What are the barriers to healthy eating in pregnancy? First, many women aren't aware of weight gain goals during pregnancy, or they aren't aware of why avoiding excess weight gain is so important for themselves and for their baby. Second, pregnant women are busy women. And in this webinar, we hope to provide you with some concrete tips for making healthy eating part of your lifestyle and part of your family's routine. Next, society has long touted pregnancy as a time when women can eat whatever they want without repercussions. One of our goals today is to dispel this myth and to discuss how much extra women should be eating during pregnancy, and this might surprise you. Lastly, every pregnant woman has experienced cravings and aversion that make healthy nutrition a challenge during pregnancy. Today we will discuss how to achieve optimal and healthy nutrition while navigating these ongoing challenges. So jumping right in, first we need to determine the goals for weight gain during pregnancy. And the answer to this depends on your weight just, be just before you became pregnant. Using the BMI calculator that we've provided, you can calculate your pre-pregnancy body mass index using the height and weight from before pregnancy. If your calculated BMI or body mass index was 18 to 25, you are classified as having a normal BMI. If your body mass index was 25 to 30, you are classified as overweight before pregnancy. And if your body mass index is over 30, you are classified as obese before pregnancy.
In 2009, the Institute of Medicine released guidelines for the amount of weight that women should be gaining based on their pre-pregnancy BMI class. For those with a pre-pregnancy BMI of 18 to 25, the goal for the pregnancy is to gain 25 to 35 pounds. In addition, they have divided the amount of weight gain by trimester. In the first trimester, the goal is to maintain pre-pregnancy weight. In the second trimester, for women who were of normal weight before pregnancy, the goal is to gain one pound per week through the second and third trimester. For those who are classified as overweight with a pre-pregnancy body mass index of 25 to 30, the overall pregnancy weight gain goal is 15 to 25 pounds with a gain of 0.6 pounds per week in the second to third trimester. And for those who with a body mass index greater than 30, the overall pregnancy goal is 11 to 20 pounds with a gain of 0.5 pounds per week in the second and third trimester. In the same report, the Institute of Medicine found that women have a tendency to gain more weight than is recommended. As you can see here in the dark gray, we see the percentage of women that gained excessive weight beyond that recommended during pregnancy. And over half of overweight and obese women gained more weight than recommended. And more than a third of women who uh, were of normal weight before pregnancy also gained excessive weight. And this has lifelong repercussions. <clears throat> Studies have shown that women who gain excessive weight during pregnancy are less likely to lose that weight in the long term. As you can see here, uh, um, women who uh, gained above recommendation was depicted by the gray triangles. And as far out as 21 years, these women um, are more likely to have postpartum weight retention or be unable to or are unable to lose the weight that they've gained during pregnancy. And this is when compared to women who gained within or below the recommended amounts during pregnancy. So I hope I've convinced you that it's very important to know your weight gain goals during pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Urban will now talk to you about how to achieve these goals uh, through your pregnancy. All right, thanks. So we're just going to get started with the second barrier. Um, so we do know, of course, that pregnant women are busy and it can be difficult to incorporate healthy eating on top of everything else that's happening at this time. Um, but a few things that can help include a weekly menu and food planning for the family, organized shopping, uh, reading food labels on packaged food and menu labeling um, when you're out at restaurants, and then creating a, home, a healthy home environment. So the USDA has created a fabulous tool to help identify and plan for healthy eating, and there are even specific options in this tool uh, for pregnancy. And the tool is called MyPlate, and it's found at that website there, choosemyplate.gov. Um, and there you can browse through a lot of great information about how to eat and how to shop. Uh, so a few key points I've pulled off here from that website are that you should be making half of your plate fruits and vegetables. Uh, that a quarter of your plate should be grains, and those should be whole grains. And a quarter of your plate can be protein. And you also want to be targeting the fat-free or low-fat uh, dairy options. Now specifically with regard to fruits and vegetables, uh, variety is key. And that's going to ensure a balance of nutrients. Um, what I try to do is eat the rainbow. That's a great tip to remember um, because the different colors in vegetables indicate different nutrients. So if you're eating a great variety of different colors, that means you're getting a great balance of nutrients. The second point is that you really need to limit juices. There are a multitude of advertising campaigns that suggest that you can get all your fruits and vegetable servings from juice, um, but Juices really don't have the full range of nutrients that a whole food does, and they don't have the fiber that's found in the whole fruit or vegetable. Um, specific fruits and vegetables can be important during pregnancy, such as the dark leafy greens, which contain folate and iron, two uh, nutrients that are very important to target during pregnancy. And then lastly, fruits and vegetables are important because they contain a lot of fiber and a lot of water. And those two items together help trigger um, your stomach, receptors in your stomach, um, which send signals to your brain saying that you're full. I also want to make a point that frozen fruits and vegetables are a great choice, especially during the winter. Not only are they convenient to prepare, 
uh, they also may contain more nutrients than the fresh produce that travels such a long way to get to us here in the Northeast uh, during the winter. So protein, of course, is especially important during pregnancy as the baby is growing and new tissue is formed, and choosing the right kind of protein is also important. Uh, so you're going to want to target uh, the lean meats, such as chicken, and then the sirloin or tenderloin cuts of beef and pork. And really, you're aiming for the a low marbling within the meat. So you can see in the picture here that there is very little white streaks running through the meat. And that's a good thing, because those white streaks represent fat. Um, fish is also a fantastic uh, low-fat uh, protein option. And current guidelines indicate that it is safe for pregnant women to eat two meals of fish per week. And in fact, other evidence shows that more is OK. Uh, now, I know there is some concern about uh, fish containing mercury. However, you can target the low mercury containing fish, such as salmon, cod, catfish, tilapia, and pollock. And let's not forget that legumes are also protein. Uh, so beans are a great option, lentils uh, and grains like that. Um, one, one point to keep in mind there is that uh, legumes with rice are a great way to obtain a good balance of amino acids, which are the building block blocks of protein. One grain that's a favorite of mine is quinoa because it is a complete protein in itself. OK, so we talked about choosing lean meats. And the reason I did that was because the and meat are saturated fat, or rather they're solid at room temperature. So you can see that depicted on the right there. Um, and the saturated fats, I think we're all aware, are associated with adverse health outcomes. Um, and of course, you find saturated fat in other animal products, cheese, butter, um, and things like that. Now on the other hand, the unsaturated fats, which are liquid at room temperature, so a lot of the oils that, that you may cook with or use on dressings, they're important for uh, babies developing eyes and brain, and they've also been associated with improved hand-eye coordination and cognition in infants. A specific class of fat, the omega-3 fats, has been researched quite a bit in the past several years. Um, and the omega-3s include both DHA and EPA, as well as ALA, or alpha-linolenic acid. Um, so there's a study in 2011 that looked at maternal intakes of DHA specifically and infant allergies. Uh, so they've classified maternal intake um, by quartile. So what you see on the top here is the moms who had the highest intake of DHA during their pregnancy, and on the bottom are the moms who had the lowest intake. Then what's in the chart is um, infant allergies. So the dark bars are those infants who had a frank allergic reaction um, to a, a specific test that the researchers administered. The model bars represent those infants who had uh, a sensitivity to the test, but, and then the white bars are those infants who had no symptoms. So I think it's interesting to note here that the moms who had the highest DHA intakes had infants with the lowest frank allergic reactions. Uh, so just some interesting uh, research that's been going on into those uh, fats in particular. I also wanted to point out, I've got a picture here of fish oil and also fish, because those two sources actually have the most bioavailable DHA and also EPA. Um, you can get some of the DHA and EPA from vegetarian sources like flaxseed, canola oil, and nutritional yeast. Um, However, the fat there is ALA. It's that alpha-linolenic acid that I mentioned before. Um, and it's a precursor of DHA, but it's not easily converted into DHA in the body. And the reason that I'm focusing on DHA and EPA is because those are the two omega-3 uh, fatty acids that have been shown to have the greatest effect. Um, so if you're not a vegetarian and it doesn't matter, then definitely go ahead for the fish oil and the fish. If you are a vegetarian, um, there are ways to just really increase your intake of ALA to get your body to, to make enough DHA and EPA. So next I want to talk about portion size, because getting portion size right is a major component of healthy eating. Um, and this website that I've listed here allows you to choose specific foods and food types to see what an appropriate portion size should be. And I've pulled out a few examples here. Um, because we've got evidence to say that over the past 50 years, you know, portion sizes in the U.S. really have increased, uh, so that we're being presented with portion sizes that are much larger than they ever were, um, you know, 50 years ago. 
So just to reorient ourselves, I put here uh, that a cup is equivalent to a, a baseball. And you want to think about that kind of serving size for things like vegetables, for casseroles or mixed dishes, um, and cereal. Uh, the meat you should be eating in about a three ounce portion, which is the equivalent of a deck of cards. And then I've got a half cup example here as a light bulb, which is appropriate for things like yogurt and whole grain sides like the quinoa I mentioned. We do have a picture here of frozen yogurt because, come on, I think we all enjoy a treat now and then. Um, I also wanted to put up uh, serving sizes of cheese because I don't know about you, but I really do enjoy cheese. I have to remember that it's very high in calories and that an appropriate serving size is just uh, three dice. So developing a plan week on a weekly basis is a cornerstone of successful healthy eating and it really is worth the time to invest on a weekly basis to develop a plan for the family's meals. In fact, studies show that those who plan ahead achieve healthier outcomes and achieve better weight maintenance. So I'm back to the myplate.gov uh, site because on there there's a tool called the Super Tracker which is a place where you can log in and um, personalize a plan for yourself. So they've got meal plans and other resources even specifically for pregnancy um, at that website there. Um, and what I've got is a, an example of a meal plan on the right-hand side, which is based on a 2200 calorie plan. And again, that 2200 calories is something you can customize when you log in. So you'll see here it really lays out everything that you can be eating throughout the day. Um, it looks generic, but there are links when you get on there for the, uh, so you see the grains and the fruit and the dairy are all in blue. Those are actually links that will bring you to pages that uh, explain specifically what you can be eating there. So I think it's just a great tool. Not only that, but you can also log what you're eating and keep track of your calories if that's a concern as well. So next, just a few points about choosing commercially prepared foods and eating out. Uh, when orienting yourself to nutrition labels, of course, the first thing you want to notice is the serving size because everything else is based on that. Um, and then, obviously, you're going to pay attention to calories. You're going to want to limit the saturated fat for the reasons I mentioned, and the sugars, which is down below under the carbohydrates. You know, pregnancy really is a time to eliminate these empty calories and, and the added sugars is a great way to, uh, to do that, to eliminate that. Um, the things you want to target, however, are the, um, the fiber and the protein. So get those as high as you can because the fiber and protein both are high satiety nutrients which will, um, as I mentioned, indicate to your stomach, which will indicate to your brain that it's time to stop eating. And they also have staying power to keep you from feeling hungry between meals. So if you're eating out at restaurants, you know, one great option is to look at the restaurant website beforehand um, and see if they've got the calories there. You know, many of the chain restaurants do. And in fact, this year, um, the national menu labeling uh, will be put into place. That's something that was uh, passed with the care bill uh, a few years ago, but and this year it's ready to get started. So be looking for the calories on the menus this year. Um, but you can also look for them on the website. Um, I think a lot of us think that salads can be a really healthy option, and they certainly can be, but you do want to watch out for salad toppings and dressing. Um, and you can ask for the high calorie ingredients like cheese and dressing, bacon, things that might appear on a salad. You can ask for those on the side or not at all. And I have to say, based on work in our lab, um, sometimes we found that really a lean cut of steak and a side of vegetables is better than any salad at that restaurant. Um, I put two examples of restaurant menu, uh, or rather rest restaurant nutrition information. One's from Panera, the other's from Bertucci's. I have two up because the Panera uh, nutrition represents a dynamic model where you can go in and uh, sort of fiddle with the food. So if you're ordering a sandwich, you can actually take out the cheese or swap out the spread, something like that, and see how that affects the total calories in the meal. Um, Bertucci's, on the other hand, as many other restaurants do, just offers a static PDF uh, that you can sort of uh, look on and, and maybe pick out something that would be good for you when you go out to eat. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about creating a healthy environment. Um, you know, a key point here, of course, is don't eat while watching TV. I think we, uh, you know, our minds kind of turn off as we watch TV, and we're not able to uh, control intake as well. 
Also, uh, throwing away unhealthy foods can be very helpful. I know that's difficult to accomplish. It's hard to sort of waste food like that, but quite honestly, you're doing yourself and your family a favor if you can throw away those unhealthy foods and swap them out with healthy snacks, things that are ready to eat, so apples, oranges, bananas, ready-cut veggies, um, the low-fat cottage cheese cups, yogurt, applesauce, all that stuff is, is a great, uh, great healthy snack that so you can just pull right out of the pantry and they're ready to go. So moving on to uh, the third barrier um, that Dr. Sen mentioned is the social pressures. Uh, this notion that we're you know, eating for two and that it's okay to gain whatever kind of weight you need to, you pamper yourself and eat whatever you feel like during pregnancy. Um, we have a link here to a video that you can watch um, afterward about Kelly Ripa who's talking with her co-host during one of her shows about how she gained 70 pounds during her pregnancy. You know, it's just another example of you know, what we're hearing from society that, that that sounds normal, but you know, really it's not. So to give you a better sense of what you should be eating in pregnancy, um, during your first trimester, really you're eating the same things that you used to um, and maintaining your weight, uh, so no added calories during your first trimester. However, during your second trimester, depending on where your weight started, you can add between 150 and 340 calories. So the 150 calories are for the folks who started off at a heavier weight, and 150 calories really is equal to just about a granola bar. That's it. Um, the 340 calories are for the normal, uh, the folks who started off at a normal weight, and that is the equivalent of two and a half uh, yogurts. And again, that's it. I think that's surprising for a lot of us. Um, then during your third trimester, you're adding a total of 200 to 450 calories. So that means over your second trimester, you're adding 50 to 100 calories, which is the equivalent of that apple or that banana that I've showed there. So if you consider how much extra food you should be eating during your pregnancy, it's, it's not a lot. So the fourth barrier we want to address is cravings and aversions. And um, cravings are very common in pregnancy and are actually a very common cause of weight gain. <clears throat> we believe that hunger is actually a common cause of cravings and that if you look after your hunger with frequent snacks and well-spaced meals throughout the day um, and also choose healthy foods for those meals and snacks, that your cravings will be fewer. Choosing foods that are high satiety, those that have uh, fiber, protein, and some good fats will also help curb, curb cravings by keeping you full longer. And, uh, you know, sometimes nothing but the food that you're craving will suffice. And in that case, what we suggest is always eating those foods in moderation. And what that means is measuring serving sizes um, and then being able to know exactly what um, what you've eaten and being able to incorporate that into your daily or weekly menu planning. What we've done is we've uh, tried to devise some substitutions for some foods that are very commonly craved during pregnancy. And of course, we started off with the famous ice cream, um, which you know, even with three feet of snow, all the husbands are out buying ice cream for pregnant wives. Um, so what we've, what we've uh, devised for the substitution for ice cream is uh, frozen yogurt with fruit. And the reason that we feel that this is a, um, a better choice uh, for pregnancy is because the um, high saturated fat content of ice cream is replaced by frozen yogurt, which has much lower fat content and also has some protein. Um, in addition, the berries provide um, fiber, they're high fiber, and also, of course, provide the vitamins that come with, uh, with many fruit products. The next example that we've provided is uh, chips and dip. And instead of the chips, uh, we've suggested doing a handful of, um, of pretzels, which provide kind of that crunchiness, the saltiness, and then substituting out the rest of the serving with um, fresh cut veggies. So we've, uh, depicted, um, we've depicted carrots and celery here, but you can do any vegetable that you, that you like. So um, bell peppers, tomatoes, and using hummus as a dip instead of the standard um, high fat dip because hummus um, is high in fiber, it's high in protein, um, and so it will, it will uh, likely be, um, provide more satiety um, and leave you fuller. And then my personal, uh, my personal 
uh, favorite, uh, favorite junk food, chocolate chip cookies, and anything with chocolate. Our suggestion is uh, for really anything with chocolate is swapping out um, those items for, uh, for pudding and chocolate pudding, which, um, which provides the, the flavor of chocolate. Um, you can make chocolate pudding from a mix with skim milk, um, which also decreases the fat content. Um, and then you can top the chocolate, chocolate pudding with um, some slivered almonds, which um, provides some of the good fats that we talked about before. You can top it with fruit. Um, all of these things um, also um, provide nutrients and uh, good, good calories. And then our last example is French fries. And this requires a little bit more of a time investment, but um, will be well worth it, we, we think, in terms of flavor and nutrition. Um, instead of the traditional we, tr we suggest trying sweet potatoes and baking them, which eliminates some of the um, fats that come with deep frying. Uh, and um, also the sweet potato provides a lot more in terms, of, uh, in terms of vitamins than the standard potato. So this is just a very brief example of some of the common cravings that women deal with. And you know, we, it's hard to um, cover all of, the different, uh, all of the different cravings and aversions uh, during this webinar, but we what we want to do is provide you with a source uh, to receive more information and to discuss kind of ongoing um, questions that you have throughout your pregnancy. Um, at Tufts now, we have an ongoing nutrition research study. Um, we offer, we're offering free one-on-one -on -one help from experienced nutritionists. This starts in the first trimester, and you'll meet weekly or biweekly with a nutritionist throughout your pregnancy. Um, and all of this will be done at your convenience, either on, phone, on the phone or online, so will not require um, any special trips anywhere. Um, these sessions will, uh, will help you with personalized menu planning, so we'll incorporate into the menu planning any nutritional needs that you and your family have such as um, if, you're, if you're a vegetarian, if you're gluten-free, all of those things will incorporate, our nutritionists will incorporate into our menu planning. Um, we'll provide recipes that are specifically, um, that are specifically targeted for you and your needs. Um, and also we'll, uh, we'll incorporate into that any cravings and aversions that you might be experiencing. So, um, so it's really a, a great resource for women who are, who are in their pregnancy and trying to um, maintain a healthy weight and healthy nutrition. Uh, if you're 18 or f between 18 and 45 years old and in your first trimester of pregnancy, we welcome you to give us a call. Our phone number is at the bottom of the screen and our email address as well. And we look forward to um, speaking with you and working with you throughout your pregnancy on maintaining, uh, maintaining healthy nutrition through this time. Um, this, I, we also wanted to introduce our, 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 key, um, our, our key study personnel, uh, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Urban, and myself, who uh, had the pleasure of speaking with you today, um, and also uh, Dr. Yapchik, our, um, one of the nutritionists who, um, who works very closely with us. And once again, our contact information for you uh, to have. Thank you very much, Dr. Urban and Dr. Sen. Um, so this is Nancy Holtzman, and we do have quite a few questions that came in. So um, I will uh, introduce some of these questions, and then uh, whichever of you feels best suited to answer it, uh, by all means. First question is about protein intake. Um, and this question wants to know, uh, for a previous pregnancy, she followed the methods guidelines um, three years ago, which really which is a lot of protein. And she had an easy pregnancy um, with no complications and delivered well. Now she is pregnant again, and she's finding it very hard to eat that much protein. And they really do encourage about 80 to 100 grams of protein. Do you feel that all of the protein is, is necessary? What are your feelings in terms of protein intake? Uh, you know, protein um, is a great nutrient because it is so high satiety. Um, and it's high satiety because it actually costs your body more energy to digest than any of the other macronutrients like carbohydrates and fat. So that's why um, eating a lot of protein can actually help you feel less hungry throughout um, your pregnancy and even you know, afterward. Um, in terms of getting that in, that is tough. You're absolutely right. Um, I think... You know, I think about the low-fat dairy options like cottage cheese and yogurt are great. I know that there are some yogurt products that actually have increased protein. Um, you can also get some of the low-fat milk that is designed to taste like higher-fat content because those milks actually have more protein 
that's how they get them to taste uh, like the higher fat content milk is that they just boost the protein in there. Um, tofu is another great lean option. Even snacking on soybeans is a great option. Um, and like I mentioned, don't forget that the, a lot of the grains have protein in them. And especially if you're eating beans and rice together, you're going to get a lot, a lot of protein. Thank you. Here's an interesting question. I've just started my third pregnancy, and I'm very nauseous and have a metallic taste in my mouth. The only time I get relief is when I eat carbohydrates and bread. So what can I do to both help myself but not gain a ton of weight? You know, I think a lot of us experience that, uh, that carb craving. Um, and part of the reason for that is that uh, refined grains are easy to digest, which means that your brain gets the glucose it needs right away, and it loves it. Um, one thing you can do is, I'm not sure if, if you're able to uh, bake your own bread or, or think about options like that, but you can. There are a lot of great easy recipes out there um, for uh, making whole grain breads. You know, and a tip that we've uh, had in our lab is to swap out half of the flour in any bread recipe for wheat bran, and that will really boost the fiber in those grains. Um, so I, I, I can understand the carb craving. I experience it myself. Um, but if you can really boost the fiber in all the grains that you're eating, it, it should help. Thank you, Dr. Urban. Uh, can you speak a little bit about anemia during pregnancy and what is the best way to prevent or treat anemia during pregnancy? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. I, um, all pregnant women um, should be on a prenatal vitamin with iron. I think that's the first, um, the first line. Um, all, it, every single pregnant woman should be taking a prenatal vitamin with iron. Um, in addition to that, um, women should be focusing on high iron um, foods in their diet. So, um, you know, of course, meats, uh, of course, we would like you to focus on the low, um, the low fat variety of meats that Dr. Urban talked about. So uh, red meats are a great source of iron, but also making sure that those red meats are lower in fat, have low marbling, are the lean cuts of meat. Um, if you're if you're using um, ground meat, ground red meat, to make sure that's the lowest type of fat or that the fat is drained off before cooking, all of those things are great sources of iron. And then there's also iron in um, green leafy vegetables um, as well, which uh, you know the amounts are less, but they're, they're still there. So um, all of those together, combined with a prenatal vitamin with iron, um, for most women is sufficient. Now, if your iron level is lower than, um, than, than expected and you're doctor, um, the doctor suggests taking extra iron, then that's another, um, another option. But that's something that you would have to talk to your doctor about is um, what your iron levels are and whether you're a candidate for getting extra iron. Thank you, Dr. Sen. Do you recommend any other supplements or nu nutritional um, vitamins, uh, vitamin D or omegas in particular? This, that's a great question. We were actually just talking about that before, before we started. Um, so a prenatal vitamin with iron is the standard right now. There are, um, there are a couple companies out there that are suggesting um, that they're a, a DHA supplement as well. Um, however, we really think that a balanced diet that's rich in, um, in DHA um, and ALA, which includes fish and all of those other whole foods, um, achieves the same levels and in addition provides other um, factors that you don't get through just taking a DHA supplement. So um, we really think that a prenatal vitamin with iron combined with a healthy, well-balanced diet um, should be adequate for most women. Thank you, Dr. Sen. Uh, can you speak a little bit about exercise and uh, when should pregnant women that have been routinely exercising or were avid exercisers, uh, do they need to limit their exercise? Can they continue throughout pregnancy? 
So um, exercise is actually very important um, to, for both your physical and your mental health uh, during pregnancy. And the guidelines uh, have been changing in the last few years. Um, we, obstetricians will now recommend for most women that if they were exercising regularly to continue their kind of baseline exercise that they were doing with the exception of women who are having any kind of complications during your pregnancy. So that is something to discuss with your doctor at your first prenatal visit. How much exercise should I be continuing during my pregnancy? Um, it will depend on your medical history, your obstetrical history, and any pregnancy complications you're experiencing. But in the absence of any complications, most obstetricians will recommend continuing, continuing exercise if that's what you were used to before becoming pregnant. Can you share any specific recommendations, in particular for a chewable prenatal vitamin? This participant says that she's, she can't keep down her prenatal vitamins. Uh, the Flintstones vitamins are actually a great a great way to get get in the uh, the, the prenatal vitamin with the iron. And um, it, I would talk to your obstetrician about whether how many to take, but it's a great substitute for the prenatal vitamins with, which tend to, to be like horse pills. So uh, that's a great way to, to get them in if you can't swallow the pill. Yeah, they taste good too. Um, this mom has a follow-up uh, for the exercise question. She says she was an avid runner, um, but her doctor told her not to exercise to bring her heart rate above 140, which for her is simply a fast walk. Do you have thoughts on that? I think that's something that, um, that you would have to discuss uh, with your doctor and find out their reasons for uh, making those suggestions because it's, it, uh, um, it can depend on your individual health situation. Okay, looks like we've got time just for a couple more questions. Um, here's a, a participant who says she's late in her third trimester uh, but has only gained 10 to 12 pounds. Ultrasounds estimate the the fetus to be at 90th growth percentile, what nutritional tips should she follow during the remaining weeks to help her fetus develop better? Sounds to me like 90th percentile couldn't be better. Things couldn't be better. You want to take this one? Sure. I mean, it sounds like you've been doing some great things already. Um, if your weight gain is um, you know, moderate, as, as you say it is, um, in the, in the, uh, the fetus seems to be growing well, um, I would just say keep Keep doing what you're doing, and uh, if you found that anything that we talked about today was different from what you were doing, then absolutely go ahead and uh, incorporate in. Sure, and and if and if it turns out that maybe you would need to gain um, more or less weight, just aim for the weight that is appropriate for you. Okay, and then um, the final question is actually about your study at Tufts. Several people uh, have asked about whether or not they'd be eligible because they don't live locally. So could you just tell us a little bit more about the study parameters and who may or may not be eligible? Sure, great, great to hear that folks are interested. Um, so as we mentioned, most of the uh, study tasks or, or uh, most of the study will happen remotely so you don't have to worry about uh, where you're located, not at all, because um, we can set you up with our nutritionist over the phone or through a Skype type uh, or a webinar just like this, we can set you up as well. Um, so we do have a couple of visits after uh, you give birth in the 6 and 12 months, but um, again, nothing that you need to worry about right away. And if you are um, not, not local, one of the things that we will do is have you sign a, a medical release form and we can obtain much of the information from your medical record from wherever you're, you're having your baby and also from the baby's pediatrician um, once the baby is born. So out of state uh, is, is definitely, we would, we, would welcome, we would welcome your interest and your participation. Okay, final question because I, of course I can't let something go without um, a benefit to talking about breastfeeding. So the last question, for those with normal weight gain, can anyone truly improve brain development of the fetus with their diet? Um, well, I think that's, that's a great question. I mean, everyone wants to do everything they can to help their baby uh, 
to be as strong as they can be. Um, and I think that uh, prenatally, one of the things that we've talked about is kind of encouraging the foods that we know are critical for brain development, foods that are rich in DHA and ALA. And then postnatally, um, of course, uh, breastfeeding and, uh, and, and trying to um, breastfeed exclusively for as long as possible um, is, is something that's been associated with, uh, with improved outcomes. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to Dr. Sen and uh, Dr. Urban. We have come to the end of our presentation today. Uh, please do check your email tomorrow for the presentation recording link, and you can watch any part of this again or share it with friends or colleagues. I'll also include um, a handout that has all of the websites that were mentioned today and other helpful resources. Dr. Sen and Dr. Urban from Tufts Medical Center, uh, Mother Infant Research Institute, the Miri Lab, thank you again so much for this important information, and thank you for participating in another ISIS Parenting Expert Speaker event. Everyone, thanks for your attention attending today, and we hope to see you at another ISIS online event soon. Goodbye.